All right, if you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Let me get this electronic device on here. All right, John chapter 20. It's great, our revival had good turnouts each evening and good, uh, good participation and good singing as I heard. So thankful for that. Looking forward to the rest of the year, what we have scheduled going on there. I know Pastor will announce again here, but we do have uh, Gold City coming at us the April the 29th. It's here just in a few weeks. That's a Friday, and that's going to start at 7 p.m. We'll continue to announce that. That's Gold City if you want to take in good singing. And so uh, we have some other stuff there and announcements by way of announcements. But let's get into this early message and then we'll get on with our breakfast. John chapter 20 uh, deals with it. There's many portions of scriptures or parallel uh, portions of scriptures that deal with the resurrection and uh, the passion of Christ, the the crucifixion. And so we're going to to grasp one of those. And this is a neat study when you begin to study these la- these three or four days that takes place right at this, this time with the Gospels. And you'll grab pieces. Mark will say something that's, that's pretty neat. Luke will say something. John will say something. And it'll be recorded in Matthew. And so when you can put them together, you get a pretty, pretty neat picture of actually what takes place and the time frame that it took place in. I'm not going to deal with all that. T- I just want to give you something. Here I have three points uh, here out of John chapter 20. And if you notice verse 19, we'll read through 19 verse, uh, verse 19 through verse 22. And scripture says this, it says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, very important, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he shewed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Now we see here in this setting, um, if you fast forward, this is just a sidebar, look at verse 24, there's one of them that isn't there. And so, and he's called the doubter, verse 24, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymaeus, was not with them when Jesus came. So you notice that one of them's not present. You'll find that in church, though something that goes on, a great event here, it was, it was the crucifixion of Christ. And uh, then they're all sad and they're, they're, they're afraid. Here it even says they're afraid of the Jews. So there's a lot going on for them that co- don't quite understand what has taken place fully. And so Thomas, he's not even there assembled with them. And so we see that there's just maybe 11 or a few of them there in this upper room. But notice with me, the first thing I want to notice is what he, what he states. And I want to dwell on this. There's more than three things, but I'm going to capture just three of them that is stated here that he says to them here. And the first one I want you to notice during this meeting, Jesus gave uh, to his disciples three things. And I want you to notice, notice with me quickly in verse 19 again, it says, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, peace be Unto you. He wanted to make sure that they had peace. And I want to, first point is peace to enjoy. He gives each and every one of us peace to enjoy. If you're a child of God this morning, and hopefully you are, uh, you have peace from God. Now you say, well, if I have peace from God, then it's a done deal. Not necessarily. Uh, Remember, we always have our will as a factor. Our will, everybody has. And so the peace of God is there. God wants to give you peace. But if you will yourself not to be a peace, especially with God's peace, uh, want to be grumpy, want to be whatever you want, you can. You can so choose to be that way or to act that way or to live in that state. 
But here, he knew they had fear. Uh, he knew that they had just come through his, his crucifixion. And now as he was here at, at Sunday morning, he had already resurrected. And so this is in the evening. And so we see here, he says, look, peace be unto you. We have we have this morning peace to enjoy. He has authority to give peace. Our Lord and Savior has the authority to give you and I uh, peace. And he wants to give peace to the whole world. Again, the factor, and they say, why don't people accept? I don't under, the understanding part is everybody has a will. Those that are here this morning have willed yourself to be here this morning. And there's, there will be quite a few that come in later, maybe for breakfast or maybe for the Sunday school hour or maybe just for the main service at 11. But however they get here, it's their will, it's their desire to be here. And so there's a will factor. You, 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 that will goes on every day. You, you figure out what you want, the blue. You, pay, you make decisions, and that comes from your will. Your will is the trigger mechanism for your makeup. Here, our will, and the will of the world, it does not want anything really to do with Christ. The Bible and Scripture says, even in the Gospel, says the reason is because he is, there's, there's somebody there looking over you. It's light, and light sheds light in dark places. And the Bible says that men love darkness rather than light because it shows their evils and their deeds, their evilness. And so there's a, there, is a, uh, there seems to be a trend, a world, somebody who's lost that doesn't want light shed on their evilness or their sinfulness. And so they have a tendency not to accept or to go Christ or to accept Christ's way. Here, as Christians, as saved child of God, we have peace and we, to, we are to enjoy this peace that he gives. So he has the authority to give peace. Number one, a Christian, your life is temporary in this world. A lot of times we don't, we don't think that. We think that we're going to live forever or we, we see years ahead, but we're not, we're not given that. We're given the moment. Uh, the Bible even states that we don't even know what tomorrow may hold. It all could change. Christ could call you home or Christ could call us all home. But it could change in a moment. But uh, as a Christian, we need to realize that our life is temporary in this world. Secondly, we need to realize at any moment you could be taken by death or by resurrection. And so we're always to be looking for the appearing of our Lord. Here, I don't even think they were looking for Christ. But he shows up, and he shows up in the midst of them. And the first thing that you see he says to them is, Peace be unto you. He wanted them to know and to rest assured that everything was going to be okay. It doesn't matter whether you're in a storm, uh, you've been through a storm, you're going through something in your life. The peace of God is there. And it, that peace passeth all understanding. Any understanding of man, any understanding of the world, or, or what you might have conjured up in your education, that peace is from God. And it it will pass all understanding of mankind. And so we're to enjoy that, realizing that. You say, man, it's kind of hard to have peace when you don't exactly know what's going to take, take part or take or hold or going to happen the next day or the next year. And people get, uh, you know, you get, you get kind of bothersome about that. You don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but here he says, look, if, if you need to know, I'm going to tell you. If not, you need to rest in my peace. But there's something else here. Uh, there's something else. Notice with me now, that's verse 19. And he states that peace be unto you uh, as he stood in the midst. But notice verse 20. We'll, we'll capture something else here. It says, and when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands. Now watch as he states this, I can just imagine the belief in their eyes and in their mind and what is racing through their minds. Because the first thing I would think, I don't know, I'd probably be shocked if I didn't pass out. Uh, it would be thinking, well, if this is the Christ, then he would have, you know, he just come off the cross. So the infallible proofs is going to be, he's going to, and he, Jesus, watch what he does here. He says, and so he shews them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. That was the realization that that was the Lord. That was the Christ. He had the nail scarred hands and he had the pierced side. This was the Christ. This was their Lord. And so I want to put proofs to believe. 
Uh, secondly, we see in verse 20 that there was a proof that was given. He showed him his hands and, and his side. So we have proofs to believe. Let me say this. It is the Holy Spirit that brings comfort to you when you're hurt. That is the Holy Spirit. Uh, it is the Holy Spirit that tells you that you're a child of God, according to Romans chapter 8. It is the Holy Spirit that empowers us to witness, to be witnesses for God. Remember Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. He, he endued power upon them that they would be, go out and be witnesses for him. We're, we're given the same commission. Nothing's changed since Acts chapter 8. Nothing has changed since the resurrection of Christ. He commissions them to send them out. And when he sends them out, he strengthens them and fortifies them, letting them know that, yes, you're going to have hurt. Yes, you're going to, you're going to suffer some things, but you're going to have peace. And you're also, God's going to give you grace. I'm going to give you grace to hold up underneath that. And by the way, I'm going to give you power to be a witness for me. You say, well, it's awful hard to be a witness. You don't understand who I work around or the setting that most generally I find myself in daily. God knows God knows, and sometimes you might be in a position where it's not going to be words that are going to be spoken. I've said this, pastor said this, that most scripture, most Bible, most God that people, the world sees will be how you live your life and how you conduct yourself in front of them or through this world. You go through this world as a Christian in a grumpy state, a lying state. Uh, a, a, a whatever type of state that a Christian can find themselves in, you're not only doing detriment to yourself, but you're bringing a disgrace and a blasphemy against the word of God and against the God that loved you and bought you with his blood. And so we need to be mindful that we've been given the power, we've been given the peace, but we need to believe that God has given this to us. Here, now this setting, looking at this historically, looking back, He's actually showing them his hands and his side. Wouldn't it be an amazing thing to see the Lord this morning and he'd say, no, I, I am he. Here's, here's the holes in my hands and here's the hole in my side. I am Christ. And so that would be amazing. Wow, it would be amazing. And so here we see the proofs to believe. Uh, he had showed them the proofs to believe. They needed to believe. They needed peace. But uh, notice something else for you and I. Not only has the Holy Spirit given us witnesses uh, to be, uh, or power to be witnesses, uh, that is the Holy Spirit that produces fruit in our life if we allow it. Galatians chapter 5 is not silent on this part. It's not silent for the Christian. Again, this is going to go back to the heart temperature and the will motive. Say, well, I don't want the fruit of God in my life. Or you might even be in a state where, yeah, I have the fruit of God in my life. And you got that mean, mean, disgruntled disposition about you. You don't. <laughs> you don't. You don't have joy. <laughs> you don't have joy. And so uh, you say, wow, ah, you don't have the fruit of God because we're willing ourselves not to allow the fruit to manifest itself in our life. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not something that you conjure up. It's the fruit of the Spirit that wants to reveal itself in your life. But you have to, and I have to be, and every Christian has to be yielded to that and willing to yield themselves to the Holy Spirit. But the power is there. The Holy Spirit wants to produce fruit in your life. Uh, there's times when we do show that fruit. And then there's times when we catch ourselves after the moment has passed. You know, you look back and you thought, man, I could have been a better Christian in that instance. I didn't say what I should have said or I didn't stand up for Christ the way I should have. Or I was just silent. And you know what they say about silence. I've learned my little business trip there. Silence means no. You know, you, you don't have to say anything. And uh, so in our life, though, as a Christian, Galatians chapter 5 speaks of this fruit that the Holy Spirit wants to produce, wants to, wants to uh, manifest in our lives. And so here I'm talking of the proofs to believe. There should be proof in your life. You say, well, you know, uh, Brother Jeremiah, I don't really, you know, there's, there's days where I just, man, I have that, I have that feeling or I have that emotion or I have that thought that, you know, I'm so far from Christ. I, I, I don't have the feeling that I'm close to Christ. You say, what is that? It's not that the Holy Spirit isn't there. You have to understand the will of God is that you yield to God, that you obey God, and that you follow God. 
There's like a formula. It, 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 and, and the formula is simple, but a lot of times it's so, here, here's the problem about the simple formula. It's very easy to lose sight of the formula of staying close and having a good relationship with God. You can lose it in a second. You can lose it in an hour. You can lose it in a day because your mind gets off into what we're involved in in our lives, uh, whatever that case may be, and then you lose sight of God. You, God's not there. You say, what, what, Holy Spirit's there. He wants to be there, but we don't, we don't have him. We don't have that relationship with him. We, we, we are disconnected with God. You say, what is that? That's our relationship. That's pending on us to, to, to strengthen our relationship with God. And so that's us. It's there. We just have him quenched or we have him grieved because we haven't prayed. We haven't read our Bible. We haven't longed for the fellowship of the believers. You say, why would God say all that? Because you want that feeling of being warmed and loved and having that good relationship with God. You're not going to have that feeling. You're not going to have that assurance unless you're doing or yielding to God. You don't get both. You, don't, you, you, got, you got one master or the other. And so, uh, so here, there is a proof to believe that the Holy Spirit will produce fruit in your life as a child of God. And it's there, but we have to be yielded to it. It's back to that will. There's something else here. Notice with me quickly. I'll move on because we have a wonderful breakfast to get to and more coffee to consume. Verse 21. Now notice with me. It says, Then said Jesus to them again, now here he says this again. And take note when this is repeated or anything in the Bible is repeated. Take note if it's said one time or take note if it's repeated again and again. He's trying to get something across or there's something that he wants you to get or for us to get or to understand. So then Jesus said to them again, he said, peace be unto you as my father hath sent me. Now here it comes. And here's where most good Christians get off the wagon. <laughs> they step down. It's like, well, that's just for the people that he calls. We're all, we all, yeah. if you're saved, we're all called. Yeah. Say, well, I don't preach every Sunday. Well, I just preach. We're supposed to preach every day. We're supposed to preach every day. The most effective preacher is the one that can preach not just through words, but through action. That's the hard part. That's why I say most Christians want to get off right here. But he says this in verse 21. He says, peace be unto you as my father hath sent me. Now, my mind, I'm not quick on my feet, but I'd be thinking, okay, well, you just were crucified. <laughs> you just, you know, there's a number of stuff you just went through. And your father sent you through that. Guess what? We, we're not greater than, than our master. We're going to go through some things as a child of God. I find amazement even in my life that I, I look back about halfway through a trial or a struggle or a tribulation and think, why am I going through this? It's a little self-pity. Then I begin to think, now wait a minute here. <laughs> Christ went through that and he was perfect. He was sinless, but yet he went through it. And then here I'm struggling with this. And you, you want good, you want biblical perspective in your life, not self-perspective in your life. So here, here he's saying, he's saying to them in verse 21, he says, peace be unto you as my father has sent me, even so send I you. And so most Christians have left. This isn't just a relationship with God, but this is a commission. This is a commandment that look, as I was sent to minister to you and to minister to the world, so send I you. You're to go into the world. You're to minister to the world and to one another. And so we see as the, as the, as the New Testament unfolds from this setting here in the early church in Acts, and you can follow it through Acts into the epistles of Paul, how the church begins to form and to work and how God commissions it. And so we see here, he said, what do you want to say? I want to say in verse 21, plans, plans to obey. God's plans to obey. Uh, Christ was telling his disciples here that peace be unto you. And he wants to say that again. There, you have peace. But as I was sent, so am I. I'm going to send you. And so we've all been sent. You say, where? Where have I been sent? To the lost that is in the world. You're, you're not of the world, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. You shouldn't be. And so what takes place in most Christians' life? We get wrapped up in the world. We, be, we, we become more like, we, we become like the world. Or we even have the thought that we have to be like the world to win the world. 
Yeah. No, that's, that's not what the Bible's saying. He wants us to be a light. He wants us to stand on truth and to be a light in that example for the world to see the light, the light of God in your life. But we dampen it. We're, we're embarrassed. We're, we're scared. Uh, or we just will ourselves not to want to do that or be that way. I'm saying we serve a resurrected Savior this morning. Uh, we have the peace of God. Uh, we, we're here. We've seen we have the power of God. We have beliefs. Uh, and we are looking at the plan. It's a simple plan. He sends you and I, every one of us. So I thought it was just the preachers or the pastors. Boy, are you sadly mistaken. It's every one of us. It is everyone that names the name of Christ is sent. And so the plans to obey the resurrection proves that God has accepted Christ's sacrifice for sin. That's what took place on Golgotha. The resurrection promises life after death, according to John chapter 11. The resurrection shows us that Jesus is alive so he can indeed intercede in our behalf. Christ is alive because if he is not alive, if he isn't alive, then we, we do not have an intercessory. We don't have an advocate before God. And as Paul puts it, we're at most men most miserable because there's, there's no go-between. But the blood of Christ was shed. Uh, the sacrifice was accepted by God. And so therefore, we have an advocate. We have a mediator. And it is the blood of Christ uh, that does this. Now, I want to... I wanna, Turn, I'm getting ahead of my notes. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. This is a powerful verse. And I have recently used this, and our uh, study in 1 Peter has used this. But notice with me, I want to show, share this with you. 1 Peter chapter 1. Speaking of the blood of Christ, the resurrection. And it does show us that Jesus is alive. Uh, and he can indeed intercede on our behalf, not only here in 1 Peter, but Romans chapter 8 and verse 34, and Christ died to redeem. Let me say that. You say, well, why did Christ die? Why are we celebrating uh, the resurrection of our Lord? Or Easter Sunday, whatever you want to call it. But is the resurrection of our Lord, why? It's because the resurrection proves that God uh, is alive. Christ died to redeem. That's the cross. Redemption. Redemption's plan, that's the reason. Uh, the pain of a ransom to free someone, that's what redemption means when you look it up. Uh, this is what Christ has done for all of those that name him as Savior. Now watch this. So when you look at this, we're not purchased with, with, with money like silver or gold. It's, it's, not a, it's not a works transaction on our behalf. There isn't a money tender that takes place. You see, God requires... He requires blood. God, God, the guy making the decisions, the one that has the final say, he ain't worried about gold or silver. He ain't worried about what we can do other than surrender our life or heart to him. He requires blood, and there's a payment. If we've sinned, and we have the sin nature, so at the moment we sin, our first sin, there is a, there is a payment. It's a death payment. The wages of sin is, I didn't come up with it. The person who wrote this Bible didn't come up with it. God, God required death for sin. Okay, so the only way you can get around that is have a sacrifice. And this is the redemption part of this. Notice with me 1 Peter. Let's read our verse. I said to go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. Notice this. For as much as ye know... We should know this, that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things. You say, why would he say that? Because religion, almost all of religion is based on that very thing, that premise. That it's things that redeems you. And it's not. <laughs> it's not. If you think coming to church three times a week is going to redeem you, that is, that is false. So that's why this verse is written. He says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers. He's speaking in the context of religion and a Jewish religion at that. But watch verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You say, how was we redeemed? How was the world redeemed? It was redeemed by the blood of Christ. 
the resurrected Savior. That's why we preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Let me say this in conclusion. It, is, uh, it was not a ransom of silver and gold that was uh, paid for or paid for for your sins, my sins. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless Son of God that was shed, His blood. As John states many years ago, and he states this in John chapter 1, he says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This morning we serve a resurrected Christ. Uh, there is a plan to obey. That plan is a simple plan. And it's presented, God presents it, because we can't be redeemed with corruptible things. He presents it, guess what? What does he present salvation as? What is it? It's a gift. It's a free gift. That's why it's a free gift. I love it. The Bible doesn't counterdict. God doesn't counterdict. It requires blood. Uh, it requires a payment. Christ paid that payment. God accepted it. Now what, uh, what is the, on our behalf? Our will, our heart has to accept that payment. I want his righteousness. I want his justification. Uh, and so we put our faith and trust in Christ and the work that he finished on the cross. I'm thankful this morning that I serve a resurrected Savior. I've never seen him with my physical eyes. I've, I haven't seen him. But there's one day that he'll call me home, whether through death, the valley of the shadow of death, or through resurrection, through the resurrection. Let's all stand this morning. Pastor, would you like an invitation or would you like to close in prayer? Amen. God bless you. Let's enjoy our breakfast.